Hi there. Welcome to Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Uh, we've got another great show for you today. Uh, every Thursday we're doing these as a live stream. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the role of the media in how, it, how in the political system. How does it function? And uh, there's a lot of strange developments that have happened with the rise of the internet. Uh, but then there are also some persistent media um, tendencies such as the idea that uh, there is there are two sides to every question uh, that are fully legitimate uh, and must be given um, complete moral um, equivalence. And so uh, there's, there's a lot going on with that tradition and the rise of the internet has also made it so that a lot of people have been able to get into independent media. And what we've seen in recent years, especially after the rise of Donald Trump um, in the Republican Party, is the rise of, or is a bunch of people who had long been on the political left as media commentators are now deciding to cultivate a political conservative or far right audience. And uh, the person I'm gonna be talking with about that today is a longtime observer of the media. And his name is Eric Bollert. And he is somebody who uh, worked as one of the original employees at Media Matters. And so it is a pleasure to have Eric Bollert with us today. And now he's uh, doing his own website uh, called pressrun.media. So please welcome Eric Bollert. Thanks for having me. All right, well, so uh, before we get into the discussion here, uh, let's maybe talk just a little bit about Media Matters. What is it? Um, it got started in 2006, and you were one of the first employees, uh, writers there. Um, but what, what does Media Matters do? And uh, just give us the history a little bit. About oh, that. sure. Media Matters was uh, David Brock's um, invention. David Brock is a uh, uh, well, he's formerly a conservative firebrand and during the Clinton years and was part of the Get Clinton crowd and wrote for The Spectator, I believe, and others. He had an epiphany and, and did a U-turn and became one of the chief critics of the right uh, on the left. He kind of arrived with um, lots of insights in terms of how the right wing media works. And uh, so, and he's also a, a, a very talented fundraiser. So he, he, um, he helped create Media Matters, as you say, um, 2006, I think it was. And the idea was to do two things, was to monitor the right-wing media, to monitor at the time Rush Limbaugh and Fox News and detail all the misinformation. And then secondly was to um, document how that right-wing misinformation found its way <coughs> constantly into the mainstream media and into the Beltway Press and the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN and how there was this kind of corrosive um, food chain of, uh, you know, uh, you know, right wing media lies then kind of dressed up. And so it's, it's this constant parade of negative narratives for Democrats and things like that. So it was kind of a it was kind of a one two punch and, uh, you know, 15, 16, whatever years later. Uh, Media Matters is, is still doing it. Um, you know, when I was there, uh, gosh, they had a staff of probably a hundred. Um, and so, you know, it's beca it became one of the, you know, important parts of the liberal infrastructure within the Beltway uh, because the media hadn't really been tackled. There was this assumption, particularly then, it's less strong today, but there's an assumption within the Democratic Party, within donors, within members of Congress, that oh the you know the media is on our side you know the New York Times is great you know they're they're fighting the good fight they like Democrats they're going to get our message out if we you know if we get a story in the New York Times about tax policy that's good because it'll it'll mirror what we're talking about that's just not true uh, and so I think more and more people uh, on the left and within the Democratic Party have come to the realize that uh, you know the mainstream media is not necessarily their friends. Uh, there needs to be pushback. There needs to be analysis. There needs to be criticism. Uh, there needs to be accountability. Um, and so that's what Media Matters uh, started doing. And, and that's what, you know, now that's what I do at Press Run. Same, 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 um, same uh, goals and same uh, approach. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just for purposes of this discussion, um, you know, there is a, a lot of 
longer podcasts out there that I feel like are kind of meandering. Uh, so we're going to try to organize the discussion around three general topics here. Uh, and that is, uh, the first one is the mainstream media's both sides fetish. And we're going to talk about that in the context both of, you know, because uh, a, a lot of people are aware that it happens, uh, but they don't know why it happens or where this idea came from. Uh, so we'll be talking about that. And then the second topic we'll be talking about, um, as I mentioned in the intro, is uh, uh, there's been a lot of left wing. Uh, they were at least, you know, at one point or another, very affiliated with progressive or liberal uh, organizations or media outlets. And now they've decided they want to have conservative and far right audiences. Um, and then the third one is. Um, probably might be a little bit more triggering for our conservative <laughs> listeners, uh, which is do conservatives hate America now? And I'll get into that a little bit more uh, as, uh, as uh, when we, when we get that, because uh, it's, because it's kind of a, it's an interesting and different topic that I think a lot of people haven't thought a lot about. Um, so, but so first uh, let, let's talk about the both sides idea. First of all, what is that Eric? And um and how commonplace do you think it is? So both both sides journalism is is an absolute hallmark of the Beltway Press, and so and and it's become a pejorative probably in the last ten years because for many decades it it seemed to work fine. So if you're on Capitol Hill, if you're in the wash, if you're in, if you're covering politics, um, your job is to reflect um, the two parties. Right. Uh, for for decades, it was a, uh, you know, basically a center left party versus a center right party. They were somewhat similar in terms of where, the, you know, they were kind of mere opposites in terms of where they uh, were situated on the political spectrum. So if you did a story, uh, you know, any political story, you went to both sides. What do Republicans think? What do Democrats think? It's pretty straightforward that that becomes uh, your product, your content, your your your, your journalism. Uh, and like I said, I think for a long time, it worked really well because what, you know, uh, the, the press kind of prizes this, this idea of independence and, and being bipartisan and being savvy enough to, to watch these right left battles unfold and to be able to cover them fairly. Uh, and to cover them fairly, you have to you have to figure out what both sides are saying. The problem is the Republican Party has changed so radically really in the last 10 years. I would say uh, it started under Obama uh, and, and for lots of reasons. And so uh, both sides has become a pejorative because uh, they're not similar. <laughs> you know, the Republican Party today is waging war on free and fair elections. They're, you know, they spent part of most of last year denying the pandemic existed. You have congressmen openly lying about a miraculously safe and efficient vaccine today during a public health crisis. This is not a center right party. Uh, this has become a much more radical and dangerous enterprise. Uh, but the press really wants to hang on to this center right, center left. All we have to do is get quotes from both sides uh, and, and, and because both sides act similarly. So, you know, just to just to uh, piggyback on this, you know, you know, a hypothetical uh, COVID or vaccine story. Uh, yesterday, uh, CNN put up a piece basically saying McCarthy and Republicans want to run on COVID. They want to run on this backlash uh, against the mask. They think it's a political winner. But re but Democrats say, uh, you know, it's irresponsible. So, you know, there you have kind of both sides. But you know, CNN shouldn't have to be able, shouldn't have to rely on the Democratic Party to conclude that lying about a vaccine is, is irresponsible, right? You don't mm -hmm. have to do that. You can make that judgment on your own. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, journalists are so nervous about the allegation of liberal media bias. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we can talk about the, the five decade crusade that has been. Uh, they're so nervous about that allegation. Um, I think they go out of their way um, not to draw obvious conclusions that they can, you know, whether it's about an insurrection, whether about trying to overturn election results, whether it's about, um, you know, the, this this uh, this scare campaign now uh, in terms of the of COVID and things like that. So 
both sides is basically a relic from from a um, a way Beltway journalism journalism used to work, and I would say it worked fine for the times. Uh, but the times have changed. The the Republican Party has become, in my view, a very radical and dangerous enterprise, and the press is still covering it like it's a mainstream party, and they're still mm-hmm. covering it um, by pre by suggesting anything unusual or out of character or controversial the Republican party does Democrats probably do the same thing. And there that's the both sides umbrella that, that allows the press not to have to make any kind of value judgment. And that allows them just to, to maintain their kind of distance. Uh huh. Yeah. And I think uh, another thing that, um, you know, people are increasingly aware of this as a deleterious phenomenon. Uh, but in terms of some of the origins, yes, there's definitely, uh, you know, this invasive fear of, of being called liberally biased, which, you know, I myself as the uh, co-creator of Newsbusters definitely played a part in that. Uh, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But the other thing also is that um, it, it's a it's a huge driver of, of both sides, you know, uh, moral equivalence is access, um, access, a desire for access, a desire for scoops, gossip, whatever you want to call it. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that the House Freedom Caucus, you know, the furthest right, most deranged Republicans in the House who have been the people directly responsible for a lot of the things that we see today, they are the biggest leakers on Capitol Hill um, <laughs> about internal congressional drama and procedure. And you never hear that uh, mm-hmm. from Hill reporters. Uh, and for good reason, they want to protect their sources. And it's mm-hmm. it's a huge reason why their you know, deranged and crazy behavior doesn't get scrutinized. Mm-hmm. Because why would you want to call attention negative attention to people who give you so much of what you know. <laughs> um, and every that's so a, often, though, I'll oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think uh, I think we saw a larger phenomena just in the Trump coverage in general um, for four years. I mean, that was a White House that was just absolutely off the rails. Uh, basically, it was run as a criminal enterprise for four years. It was unethical. It was corrupt. Uh, it was vindictive. All all the things we could talk about for a whole hour, um, but it wasn't really portrayed. You know, nine times out of ten in the daily news coverage. I'm not talking about the commentary and things like that. I'm talking about the the straight ahead news coverage. There were days you would think Jeb Bush were president, and I'm talking 2020, 2019, not like Trump's first three months in office. There were reports that I would see. You would think John McCain were president. You know, this is just a typical Republican administration. This is what they're doing today. Just just a complete lack of context. Uh, and especially four years into that circus, that nightmare. Um, and I think a lot of that had goes to the point you made, which was access. So if you don't have to make a judgment call, even though you know Trump is probably mentally unstable. You know he's a pathological, as a reporter covering the White House, you know he's a pathological liar. You know he's a racist. You know all of these things. If you're not forced to make that judgment call, why would you? Because it's a leakathon. I mean, there's all this gossip at the White House. Um, everyone who covered that White House got a book deal, and those book deals do not come cheap. A lot of people have second homes because of that Trump administration and because of the access and because of the drama they were able to collect. So yeah, what, what's the incentive to be forthright? What's the incentive to, to on a daily basis? Look, I, I mean, I, I wrote about this 55 times. There's a reason the Beltway Press collectively, without exception, on day one, announced we are not going to call Donald Trump a liar. Now, the Washington Post documented 20,000 lies he told in four years. And the Washington Post told the newsroom, do not call him a liar. <laughs> what, how, what, no one is able, no one in any position of power has ever been able to rationalize or explain that. But I think the point you made and the point I'm making goes a long way to that, um, which is access and, and, and not wanting to upset this and, and not wanting to put 
what Trump did to this country in a super clear focus in the in, in the news coverage for four years. Yeah. And then I think the other thing is that there is, um, you know, and as somebody who who once, you know, was more of a moderate conservative, you know, I was constantly seeing reporters that, you know, they were trying to find people that they thought were, you know, reasonable conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and to try to talk to them. And, and like you see that on the on the Sunday shows, you know, like they've they've got Asa Hutchinson, who is the governor of Arkansas and has no power in in the Republican Party whatsoever, does not speak for them in any way, shape or form. But he is the guy who gets booked on all the Sunday shows uh, because apparently you have to go to the governor of Arkansas to find a Republican who's not going to lie and, you know, gaslight people about COVID. Yeah. Uh, he seems to be the only one. I mean, um, and, and just real quick, think about how far down the list you have to go to get to the Arkansas, governor of Arkansas. Uh, but that's a very good point, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, but the thing is though, that in their desperate search for conservative rationality, a lot of yes. them are willing to, you know, give a pass to people who don't act in good faith and who oh actually are trolling the media themselves. Yeah. So like they'll, you know, like there are all these endless articles about, uh, oh, you know, well, so-and-so official, will he turn on Trump now? Yeah. You know, uh, and, and guess what? They never did. They yeah. never did. And, and, and there was just this repeated, uh, you know, I mean, the, and the Atlantic probably is the worst uh, the publication that does this. The New York Times does it a lot too. But yeah. like this idea that you know, well, if we just if we just sit them down enough and talk to them, well, by golly, they're gonna they're gonna shape up, aren't they? Yeah. Look, I mean, you know, terms like cult, terms like brainwashing, obvious descriptions, obvious um, ways to describe what happened for four years were never touched. Um, and, and that, that's just, you know, that's just always been the way it worked to, you know, the day after the insurrection, New York times, big headline, this was a news headline, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, Republicans, you know, Republicans face Trump reckoning and the New York times was sure this was going to be the turning point. There's no way the Republican party, uh, could, could, uh, remain loyal to Trump. I mean, my God, look, just look what happened, you know, in the last 24 hours. And that's their mind, you know, and that was their mindset. It was insanely naive, uh, even though 140 members of the House had just post insurrection, you know, like three hours after this Capitol was stormed, still voted to try to overthrow the election. But yeah, it's this purposeful professional naivete, I think is one way to put it. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of people know it's kind of a charade, it knew it was a charade and it was a dance uh, while covering Trump. But so why why this why this obsession with finding those rational Republicans? Why this idea that uh, you know after four years there's still you know a powerful group of why? Because they wanted they 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 refused to tell the truth about the party in whole. So if they held out this fantasy that you know there were there were Republicans be, besides the same five Republicans they voted they quoted for five years Mitt Romney McCluskey you know the same five who showed up in every story if they made maintain this fantasy that there were twenty or thirty Republican centers like that they could main then they could keep up this 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 ridiculous narrative that Republicans can't sleep at night knowing what Trump's doing. Trump's doing this to the Republican Party. If, if they could just break this bond, Mitch McConnell, you know, would not, you know, shove through a Supreme Court justices eight days before an election. That's all Trump's fault. Right. And it's baloney. And, and, we, and we know it's and we know it's BS. Uh, the Republican Party is doing what it's doing because it wants to. Um, and, and so in a weird way, Trump provided the press coverage for uh, in, in order to play nicely with the Republican Party, right? They, you know, uh, particularly the Times and the Post and others for years just absolutely maintain this, this storyline. Like I said, Republicans are just at their wits end about Trump. And my, if he would just get off the stage, they could get back to being, you know, hardworking, you know, patriotic, honest brokers, which is 
total bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think the other thing is that, um, you know, beyond, beyond the access or related to the access desire, there is this idea, a very naive idea among a lot of, of editors and executive producers um, at uh, TV shows that, you know, political partisan elected officials. So pol elected officials are the ones who drive what happens in Washington. Um, and, and you know what, it's not to say that that's not true at all, uh, yeah. but the reality is that interest groups, especially on the right, yeah. um, they drive and, and the donors. So like for instance, the Republican tax cut of 2017, uh, large Republican donors were, they, they, they started blasting the Republican party for not getting this done, giving them their money. And they were literally threatening them in the press. We're not going to give you money for 2018 unless you do this right now. Um, right. And that was a story that you almost, you know, like people would one like runs one story about that. Right. Uh, right. But the reality is that ought to have shown these editors and these executive producers. Wow. Maybe we should pay attention to these people because guess what? They got what they wanted. <laughs> they got what the they wanted. Yeah, yeah. and you know, and like you've got this group, the Council for National Policy, and you know, yeah, and a yeah, bunch yeah. of these very powerful, you know, Christian, active, like open Christian supremacists who yep, talk yep, about yep. how they're going to take away rights of atheists or Jews or Muslims, uh, LGBT people and women. Um, and they basically, you know, have untrammeled power in the Republican Party, and no one ever pays attention to them. No, that's such a good point. I mean, the Republican Party today, if you're talking about members of Congress, I mean, it's such a reactive body. I mean, what was what was the last time they initiated any kind of policy push of any significance in the last, you know, 10 years? Uh, and those interest groups on the right are so much more powerful than the interest groups on the left, which just don't have the money, the bang for the buck, the relentless push. You know, they tend to try to work with the Democratic Party and understand the Democratic Party is under siege by particularly in the era of Trump. Uh, but yeah, you know, you turn on the TV and, and, and you know, you you see Senator Kennedy from Louisiana like he has any power to do anything. I mean, he's just, you know, he's just there to fill time and produce some content. I mean, none of these people, particularly, you know, in the last four or five years, none of them produce much of anything. And a, and a real quick point about the coverage of the tax cut. Um, you know, when Biden came in uh, and within 48 hours, the press was demanding why he hadn't united the country yet. And the way you unite the country is you must pass, a, you know, a bipartisan COVID relief bill. Right. Even though every Republican, this is a bill that it had 80 percent public support, ended up getting, I think, zero. <laughs> yeah. No, it got zero. There was zero. Yeah. Zero votes. And it couldn't even get Romney in the usual suspect of four zero votes in the house zero votes in the senate this is one of the most popular pieces of spending uh spending legislation in half a century uh, and biden couldn't get a vote and, and the press was beside itself well uh but you go back to 2018 trump didn't get a single democratic vote for those tax cuts trump trump was savvy trump was aggressive trump was bold trump didn't care what his opponents thought you know so it's a totally different way uh, of covering the republican and democratic party Dem for every piece of legislation in, 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 in terms of the eyes of the Beltway press, if you're a Democratic president, nothing, nothing is more important than securing Republican votes. If you're a Republican president, the press couldn't care less if Democrats all said no. Uh, it's, it's just uh, it's one of these weird traits that, uh, that, that really came into uh, highlight once Biden came in and the press overnight went back to worshiping at the altar of bipartisanship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so just to, uh, you kind of uh, touched on interest groups here that kind of dovetails nicely with our second topic, which is toxic left-wing pundits seeking far right audiences. Um, and so, you know, and I, I guess, you know, as somebody who has changed places politically myself, um, you know, it's an interesting subject to me, yeah. but in your case, you know, you were there on, as a, as a progressive writer, you know, when a lot of these people, and, and I'm talking about people like 
Glenn, Glenn Greenwald or Matt Taibbi or, right. you know, some of these other uh, people out there. And, and we don't necessarily need to talk about any one of them individually. Um, but it's, it's notable, I think, that, um, you know, there's this, well, there are a lot of reasons it seems that that they have decided to go after far right audiences. When, uh, tell tell me about some of your theories and why does this keep happening? Yeah, you know, and and, and it's a fair point because I just talked about David Brock, who kind of changed teams. You uh, you mentioned you've had a you know a, a dramatic change of perspective for politics. So I don't think there's anything in and of that self wrong. I think what's I think what's wrong with these writers is they won't admit what they're doing. <laughs> you know, they still pretend, you know, they're coming at the, you know, they're viewing the world from a populist left perspective uh, when they're basically just become MAGA mouthpieces. So I think there's there's a dishonesty. I mean, if you want to change teams, make that U-turn and go full force. You wouldn't be the first, you wouldn't be the last. And, you know, good luck to you and, and, and count all that money. I mean, Oliver yeah. Willis has talked, you know, who used to work at Media Matters and I mean, he's talked for years. I mean, if he decided overnight to become a conservative, uh, you can't even count how much money Oliver Willis would make. You know, it, 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 it is people don't understand. You do. People, most people don't understand, don't understand how much money that the conservative infrastructure in Beltway, they are, it, they don't even know what to do with it. I mean, they literally don't know what to do with all the money. So if you emerge as a voice, as a popular voice on the right, guess what? And I'm not, and I'm not saying these were specifically happens to the, one, the the two writers you talked about, but you get a you get a, a writing gig, you get a speaking gig, you get a speech tour gig, uh, maybe you, you get a, a podcast, deal. you yeah. get book deals, many book deals. So you go from making hundred and ten thousand dollars a year to making six hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, and and beyond. And then you get a fox, to, you know. And then you're a contributor. I mean, the money is astounding in terms of this uh, right wing uh, media infrastructure, um, cradle to grave, and and we've seen it before. So I think for folks who who go to the right. Uh, and and it's funny because I have a Substack newsletter, Press Run, uh, Taibbi, Glenn Greenwald, others. They also are on Substack now. Um, and they have a lot more followers than I do. I don't begrudge anybody. Um, yeah. But you can just make a ton more money. I mean, that's the bottom line. I mean, it's always been the bottom line. I don't know if that was their motivation. I don't know if that's why they decided to become apologists, essentially, for Donald Trump. Uh, relentlessly run down the Democratic Party, um, enter into very kind of un just for my um, from my perspective just really uh, murky and disturbing uh, areas in terms of race in, in in this country and 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 minorities and white power and all that stuff cancel culture you know crying to them crying yourself to sleep at night over supposed liberal cancel culture and things like that. Um, but so Glenn Greenwald, for instance, you know, it's interesting. I wrote a book in uh, Bloggers on the Bus, How Internet Changed the Press late. I think that was 2008. Uh, Glenn was a chapter in my book. He was an absolute star of the liberal blogosphere, uh, very persuasive uh, critic of the Bush administration uh, and things like that. Um, and, and now uh, he's Tucker Carlson's best friend and runs re interference for Fox News on a daily basis, runs interference for the Trump administration. Has spent the whole year downplaying the insurrection, mocking people who, who suggested it was a, a, you know, a violent event and things like that. So if you're going to do that, then obviously, you know, you're just, you know, you're just a Fox News contributor. You're a Fox News voice. But they seem to want to hang on to this idea that they're the truth tellers and you know, mm -hmm. and, and they're they're viewing the real world from you know a populist anti elite uh, perspective, but uh, uh, well, it's yeah, well, and it's total nonsense because yeah, oh, and and the that, idea and that's, that and that's Donald another, Trump, yeah, okay. that, and that I'm sorry, that was another quick point. If you want to make a U-turn, if you want to switch teams, that's fine. Yeah. But if your arguments are garbage <laughs> and they're just incessantly dishonest, uh, you're going to get called out for it. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, the idea that Donald Trump is populist, like, it's such yeah. a total lie. I mean, all you have to do is look at the guy's actual policies. Like, 
Yeah, you know, sure. He he likes to be vulgar and crass and swear on you know as a president, which is un you know completely unheard of. Um, but his actual policies were about you know redistributing wealth to the top one percent of Americans. Oh ProPublica just a matter of, uh, or just this week reported how uh, some of Ron Johnson, the Wisconsin senator, uh, his top donors pressured him to not vote for the for the Trump 2017 tax cut because it didn't it wasn't catered specifically enough to them. Uh, <laughs> and so he he did just that. And and then and then Trump gave him exactly what he wanted, what the donors wanted. Um, and, you know, if you look at the at the uh, various tax projections about what the law does over over 10 years, it actually right. raises taxes on on the poorest Americans. Um, so the idea that Donald Trump, and that's just one, like he, he, he tried to take away people's uh, you know, insurance that they got from yeah. Obamacare, uh, like he not just lower it, uh, the threshold, but like completely scrapped the law. He's, you know, pushed for uh, all kinds of uh, policies that promote, uh, you know, that bust, that attack unions. Um, sure, like, of course. These are not, this is not a populist guy. Uh, so for Glenn Greenwald or any of these people to go and say, oh, well, Donald Trump is, you know, I, he's a populist like me. No, he's not. He's just a loud mouth uh, and you're selling your soul to support yeah. him. And, you know, and I think a lot of the what I call the faux left or whatever, you know, they push Trump as a, as a dove. Right. And, and, and we can't really talk about this movement without talking about 2016. They're just uh, naked hatred of Hillary Clinton, the misogyny that, that fueled a lot of that. So obviously this is the old horseshoe politics, right? The far left meets up with the far right and, and they find united themes. And obviously mm -hmm. that's literally what, what has happened. Uh, but yeah, you know, a lot of them push Trump as a dove. And to this day, oh, Trump didn't start a war. Oh, gosh. But, you know, look at all the Democratic wars. You know, Trump increased bombings in Somalia, you know, through the roof. Uh, he increased bombings in, in lots of places. So and it's just another. Yeah. Yeah. It's just another. Empty, and, and empty trying to reinstate torture. Uh, yeah. All, I mean, <laughs> all that stuff. They, you know, these people claim they uh, care about stuff, as you say, you know, stuffing the pockets of Wall Street. I mean, that was that was. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Matt Taibbi made his career out of decrying that while he was at Rolling Stone. Uh, but apparently now that's that's that was OK when Trump did it. So, yeah. yeah and, and um, you know, it's you know, you know, I do think a lot of this is kind of the newsletter uh, media culture, too. You know, I think you can find that niche. Uh, and so if you're getting people to subscribe, like, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have some people subscribe uh, to Press Run. So if if you tap into something if you tap into a column, if you tap into a vein, you can see the response in terms of dollars that day. <laughs> and so if you're at a supposed faux left and you run an Obama bashing column and your, you know, your Stripe account, which is which does all the transactions, goes through the roof that day. Guess what? <laughs> Yes, you are popular among conservative consumers, conservative consumers who buy books, who buy diet pills from Fox News and buy newsletters. You have just tapped in to basically unlimited resources. And guess what? Um, it pays really well. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I, and I do want to say that, um, you know, it, 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 as somebody who is, has seen the market you know, the con consumer market, the uh, reader slash listener slash viewer, whatever you want yeah. to call it. Um, you know, it is it is an unfortunate thing that a lot of progressive uh, media consumers are, are just content to watch it. Mm. And and whereas if you look on the conservative side, you know, they will say, wow, this person is standing against the, the forces of Satan. I have to give them money. Uh, and they do. And, and they, they do. do. And, so, and it, it is amazing. You know, again, God bless, you know, uh, all the people who who um, pay for my um, newsletter. It's really a miracle. And it's, it's humbling when you put, publish a newsletter and you see people subscribing and renewing. Um, so um, 
so there are lots there are folks on the left who do want to support that voice but yeah you just multiply that by 10 and i think you're basically looking at the same pool on the right they have just been taught from an early age uh that if you don't if you don't send your money now all of this your your way of life may disappear i mean mark Levin. Uh, um, as the number one book in the country, right? And and uh, right now, and so yeah, they've been printing money on that side for a very long time. And in general, it's hard to scratch that out on the left. So I, I mean, it's very alluring. I mean, if if you're generate, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Greenwald's making a hundred thousand dollars a month off his newsletter. Um, and and if you're willing to sell your soul at some point, you think. Why am I not going to do this? Why am I, why am I not going to be an apologist for that guy? Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, and some of the other things that there are also other reasons. It seems that we've seen kind of these these panderings, um, and I think it's well. One thing I do want to say is that you know because the Fox News and right-wing media world is so devoid of actual policy content. They never yep. talk to them about what their actual beliefs are. Uh, right. Everything is about, you know, oh, the Democrats are mean. The Democrats right. are elitist. Uh, you know, and oh, oh, we hate Fauci or vaccines or whatever. Right. Like, they never ask. So, so we actually don't know where these people are at ideologically right. because a, they don't talk about it on the media outlets they go to, and then B, um, they they will not engage with progressive critics anymore, um, and which is hilarious because they talk about being canceled. Well, they've basically said, <laughs> "I will not debate anyone who will say mean things about me." Right. Um, hey, just and, just a quick point because you were talking about the lack of uh, seriousness on the right, and, um, and we were talking before about the media desperate to find people who. Um, um, who aren't just Trump believers and things like that. CNN had a really time, a tough time for four years. You know, they churned through a lot of people who turned out to, you know, um, Lindowski for a while was on the payroll. Obviously at the end, Rick Santorum became a big problem, uh, but they were committed to this kind of both sides uh, were, you know, C CNN, we live between MSNBC. If you think they're too liberal, if you think Fox is too conservative, you know, we're the channel for you. We're going to present uh, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we're going to have a robust debate. We're going to look at this thing. And they very quickly realized anyone, um, anyone who showed up that was basically a Trumpist uh, was just going to lie nonstop. Uh, and it was going to embarrass the network. I forget his name off the top of my head. They hired that young Republican congressman whose claim to fame was being on the MTV reality show. Um, uh, and they hired him in 2018. Sean Duff, Sean Duffy? Sean Duffy, yeah. Yeah, so they hired him. Um, and like the third time he was on, the, the, he ended and the anchor had to come on and basically apologize and say, oh, everything he just said was a lie. This happened like two or three times in the first 10 days. Uh, he's now working for Fox News. Uh, and then Rick Santorum, they thought, oh, okay, well, you know, here's our safe go-to guy. He'll defend Trump, but pe pe viewers see him as being rational and kind of common sense and straightforward. And in the end, you know, he made those comments about, you know, when colonists came to America, there was nothing here just empty trees, you, you know, forests. And we made this and made America into this wonderful thing. Uh, no, nobody, there were no natives walking around. And so they finally, you know, had to let and him they go. And didn't influence America. No, yeah. and, it, and Native uh, American culture didn't influence <clears throat> America, even though, you know, 32 of our states are named after, Indian, you know, Indian uh, phrases and languages. Uh, so, um, uh, so yeah, you know, it, it, it became a struggle and and but it was only a struggle because they were so committed well we we have to have the trump voice on our network we have to how are we going to he's the president they run the federal government um but it was as you say it was almost impossible to find anyone rational it was bad enough they had people like peter navarro as senior trump administration officials on constantly lying about a pandemic through all 2020 uh, it was equally bad when they were paying people 
to lie on Trump's behalf because they were so dedicated to this both sides uh, paragon. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, we had an interesting comment just come in uh, from somebody named Red Rage 1972. And this person says, um, if crazy right wingers don't get a platform on the mainstream media, people won't see how crazy their click is. Mm. What's your mm. response to that? What do you think of that? Oh, so if I read, if I hear that correctly, is it's good to give them a platform because America needs to understand kind of how crazy they are and how dangerous they are. Is it, yeah, I think do you, that's th the you point. think that was the idea? Yeah, you yeah. know, I, I think maybe if we're talking the Trump years, that would have made sense for the first three or four months. Then at, at that point, I think everyone understands. Uh, I think there's, I don't think it's worth giving these people a microphone because they already have so many. I think the problem is if you give them a microphone, you have to be very specific that they are crazy. The problem is the press is giving them a microphone and, and depicting them as, as just normal folks. I mean, we, we haven't talked about the, you know, the Ohio diner trend for four years. You know, I think the New York Times had, had correspondents camped out, you know, in the middle yeah. of Ohio and Wisconsin, these Midwest, Midwestern states, literally dozens, maybe a hundred articles uh, among mainstream media outlets. Uh, and it, it was just, they weren't newsworthy. They were just checkups. And what what do what do white middle aged men in red counties and red states think about Trump in 2017? In 2018? Mm -hmm. and, oh, they yeah. love him. Okay, that's a news so, story. Yeah. So the the, yeah. the going to that 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 person's comment. If you're going to highlight these people, the problem is the mainstream media did a really bad job at highlighting them. It 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 uh, gave them cover. And it kind of whitewashed what was really going on. If you lived in a news vacuum, you would have been shocked by that insurrection because the New York Times for four years told you these Trump voters were just honest, hardworking folk who finally found their voice in Washington. You would not know that Trump for four years had had cultivated, you know, a murderous mob because that was not the story of Republican voters that the Beltway Press wanted to tell. Yeah. And then I think the other thing is that, you know, the when you're when you specifically platform people and identify them, yeah. uh, you are you're advertising their ideas, um, you're yeah. advertising their personalities um, and their websites and whatever. Um, so I do agree um, with our commenter that it's important to understand these ideas and know that they're relevant and influential. But you do it by talking about the ideas in the larger context, not in the idea of the specific person. So, like, for instance, uh, you know, you've got uh, Ben Shapiro, who is this, you know, total snowflake uh, kind of dimwit guy uh, who can't debate. The only people he wants to debate are college freshmen. Uh, <laughs> he literally will not debate. And you've got people like Steven Crowder who, uh, you know, actually ran from a debate when he was it was going to have it with Sam Cedar when somebody brought him on to oh, a yeah, live right. stream. Yep. Yep. Uh, so these people cannot debate their ideas. Um, so they don't deserve to a, a platform mm, uh, a unless they're going to become, you know, unless someone's going to come at them and really challenge them. Because yeah. if you if all you're going to do is just say, well, gosh, here are these people and they have these ideas that are unpopular. The end. Right. Like yeah. that's a piece of shit article. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and so you're not you're not giving it the scrutiny that it deserves. And the same thing, you know, like we're we we we've gone from the you know do Trump voters and diners like Donald Trump? Why yes they do. We've gone from that to to people who hate vaccines. Do they really hate vaccines? Oh gosh, they do. Uh, and 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 they're mm -hmm. you know. And they make, you know, and they make no effort to persuade them or show, you know, well, you think X is true. Well, here's the thing that shows it's not true. You think Y is true. Here's how yeah. it's not true. They don't do any of this stuff. And so basically, no, 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 in no, no. effect, no. in effect, they're doing kind of trying to have an open mic night um, on the cruise ship as it goes down. Uh, yeah. When people for the people who sank it, <laughs> who made the hole, come and tell us about what yeah. you did. Uh, that's what, that's you know, and, and what that, this is. And that raises a really good point. It's been one of my pet peeves for years um, in terms of, you know, and, and I think this will probably segue into that third topic. But, you know, 
what we're seeing this anti-vaccine hysteria and, and things like that. And, and, you know, the press not only doesn't want to talk about how radical the Republican party is, doesn't want to talk about how deranged the conservative movement has become uh, complete, you know, brainwash. is just not a word the mainstream media will use in terms of talking uh, about what's happening. Cult, you never, ever in a, in a straight news story, are you allowed to talk about this cultish behavior? And, you know, and, I, and now we're seeing these rash of these hysterical school board meetings where uh, parents, and usually parents only, I don't see students complaining about mask mandates. It is this irrational, it was Franklin, Tennessee, two nights ago, uh, where a local doctor came down and volunteered his time and, and, and talked about the safety benefits of, of having a school mask mandate. Um, and afterwards, the, he, he needed, a, you know, the, the video was all over Twitter. He needed a police escort. He probably would have been beaten and dragged from his car. People were saying they know where they live. They're going to come and get him over a cloth facial covering for students during a pandemic. So and, and, uh, and I see a lot of people in, you know, I've been highlighting these and, and been talking about it on Twitter. And, and a lot of comments are, how do people get like this? And, uh, and that is the question. People aren't born that way. People aren't born with a consuming rage about a cloth mask covering during a pandemic. You have to be brainwashed. You have to become a cult follower. And that is what's happening to conservative politics in this country. And you are just not going to see that in the coverage. What, what coverage do you see? Oh, there's a backlash against masks. CNN the other day in that article I, I highlighted previously, uh, I talked about previously. Oh, the Republican parties think they're going to, they're going to uh, uh, take advantage of this backlash. Well, according to the polling, there is no backlash. According to the polling, a clear majority, 60, 70 percent of Americans approve of mask mandates and, and things like that. Uh, but so not only is the press buying into this idea that there's this widespread protest across the country. Um, when they focus on the protests that exist, there's no brainwashing, no cult, no. Yeah. These are just hardworking folk who can't sleep at night because their kids might have to put on a mask and go to school. I mean, nobody wants to wear a mask at school. I mean, I understand that, uh, but people aren't born that way. Their brain has to be rewired and there's very little discussion about who's rewiring it and the long-term consequences of that rewiring. And it's obviously QAnon. And, and just real quick, the, you know, the mainstream press wants to cover QAnon as this separate thing, fringe thing over here, doesn't really have anything to do with the Republican Party, doesn't really have anything to do with mainstream conservative uh, politics in this country, which is a complete lie. And, and that's, yeah. that's, that's the ugly truth. The, the news outlets don't want to talk about because it goes back to our very first point, the fear of the liberal media allegation. Yeah. Um, well, and, and I think the other thing that they also are not talking about is that uh, the, the mainstream press, you know, they're so interview dependent. Um, yep. And what that means is if somebody's going to lie in an interview or they're not going to tell the full truth of what they are or, you know, who they are and what, why they're doing it, yeah. well, then you, you're, you're not going to know as, a, as a, main, a lazy mainstream reporter. And so, like, we've seen this over and over with the, um, you know, the critical race theory Ugh, uh, no, no, protests, no, no, and now they're doing it with the, with the mask stuff. These yeah. protests are deliberately engineered by Republican activists, um, and they have publicly said this. So this right. is not like a conspiracy theory that this is going on. They're boasting about, ha ha, look, we're sending our activists over to the Leesburg School District in Virginia, yep. and we're gonna we're gonna bend them to our will and make a national controversy over this. Um, look at what we're doing. We're so awesome. So they've said this. Um, yeah. And very proud Fox of it. News. Yeah. And and uh, your you know your your uh, former colleagues at Media Matters have you know came out with a study that showed Fox News had interviewed dozens of these people I th parents. and never and never <laughs> disclosed who they were. They're just concerned parents right. um, who, who, who have a problem. 
Um, and, you know, and, and, and they're doing the same thing like with this mask. So, it, for instance, in Tennessee, there was a, an anti-mask protest in Nashville after the, uh, the Nashville school district um, or, or a suburb there yeah. um, it, it said they were going to require masks for students. Um, there was a protest that was, you know, a bunch of people piled into a meeting. And one of the people who was there was Clay Travis, who was this right wing, <laughs> just talk radio host. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, so, but they're such a, they're, they, they don't, they're so ill equipped to understand when something is being, you know, yeah. artificially astroturfed that they just cover it. The mainstream press just covers it. Oh, wow. Look at these people. They, yeah. They, look what they're doing. Well, you know, that that goes back to literally my number one, my number one rule of Beltway journalism. Every news cycle of every day starts with a simple premise of what are Republicans angry about today and everything else flows from that. And you mentioned critical race theory. Uh, you go back to the Tea Party, you go back to Obama scare. Uh, and now we're doing it with the mass protests. last year. Just about this time, it was the reopen protests. I remember writing about that at Press Run. And, and, you know, there are local reports of, you know, over a dozen protesters. OK, well, the county that that happened in, you know, there's 700,000 people. Why would you, that possibly be considered news or the suggestion that's part of a, you know, a nationwide backlash? Right. So their the myopic view is what are Republicans, conservatives angry about today? Uh, and and then then a complete lack of understanding, as you say, about again, going back to my point, the billions of dollars and, and, and the infrastructure Republicans have to literally invent these things. And third part, you have a right-wing media that's actively brainwashing people. So there's, I, I'm not suggesting this. all these people are actors. There are deranged people who show up on their own will. And the, the, these, thing, these events are, are created perfectly, uh, pop-up events, uh, and those don't come cheap. So it's a combination of all those things. The press comes in, doesn't see any of it. They just the, you know, oh my gosh, they're angry. We have to interview these people. Uh, they're talking about on Fox News, this must be a national movement. Uh, and, and then, uh, and oh, by the way, we have to leave out all the polling that says the vast majority of Americans are fine with masks. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so shoddy. shoddy. Um, and, you know, so uh, we're, we're uh, coming up on time here, unfortunately. Uh, so I did want to um, get to our third topic, which is do conservatives hate America? And, you know, I, it's something that when I've raised this topic with conservatives um, before, they, uh, they always get very angry at this idea. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and honestly, probably for good reason, because they've yeah. you know, created their entire political brand about how right, liberals right. hate America. Uh, right. but, here, but here's the thing. So as, you know, I think you can, you can look at the January 6th you know, Capitol attack. Yeah. This is the ultimate manifestation of this radicalization. Yeah, so, of course. You know, as somebody who who you know worked in the conservative media environment for a long time, what I saw was that you know um, a lot of people, you know, a huge probably the majority of them had you know Christian supremacist viewpoints that you know they wanted they wanted to take away rights of of liberal Christians or right. non non Christians, atheist Jews, etc. Uh, they thought that you know right wing Christians should have more rights. Um, but then they also, you know, they kept thinking that ideas which had no popular support ever. So like eliminating Social Security right, or right. Uh, privatizing Medicare, like things like th these, you know, or, or eliminating the Department of Education. Like they're still obsessed with these ideas <laughs> um, and these ideas will never happen. Right. Um, like they will never, never re 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 elected Republicans are even as extreme as they are, they will never push these policies. Um, and so what's happened is that there has been this enormous radicalization yeah. uh, because when you want something for so long and then you never get it. Um, even when you have a Republican be, president. Yeah, and Congress, um, yeah. you know, you, you, you it, they, they, they become deranged from this. Um, and and the, the more religious ones have become even more deranged yeah. because 
they for a long time had this idea that well if we if we cut the government that will force people to rely on local institutions like their church and we'll force them back into church by cutting their budget uh or regulations or whatever and of course that didn't happen either because you know imagine that uh taking people's ability to have you know abortions or birth control it has nothing to do with whether they go to church what yeah, right. how how does that work um and whether a billionaire gets a tax cut, well, gosh, it has nothing to do with whether someone believes in God or the Bible. Uh, it, these things are not related at all. And so they, a lot of them with the Trump, uh, the rise of Trump in 2016, they began feeling like this, we, we are losing America. And right. You had this, uh, you had this guy who uh, wrote a, an essay in the Claremont Review of Books, who later went on to work in the Trump administration. He wrote an essay called "The Flight '93 Election." Michael Anton was his name, and he literally said, "You know, the 2016 election. This is life or death. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't have a Republican in the White House, then America will be over." Mm -hmm. And oh uh, yeah, and and. You know, and, and of course, they've said things like this uh, for 50 years. Uh, yeah. But the problem is, you the more you say that stuff and the more it doesn't happen, like they've been predicting a debt crisis for 70 years. Oh, you right, know, right, right. America's, uh, no one's going to believe our, 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 give us, buy our, our bonds or whatever. Um, and so everything they say is wrong and, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. their extreme rhetoric never yeah. pans out. And so they just have to keep amping it up and up and up. And now we're seeing the point where, um, you know, I, I regularly see right wing podcasters, commentators, columnists talk about how, oh, you know what? I'm against the American Olympic team this year oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. they have transgender athletes or, right, right, you know, right. I'm against Simone Biles because Simone Biles is pro-choice. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, 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 and you're seeing this over and over and like the there's this really emerging viewpoint a lot among a lot of far right uh republicans that america is over right uh, and, well, and we hate america now well look uh, at look at just last week right they hate in the, or the last 10 days uh they hate as you say american olympians which is unheard of you know this is the third i, I tweeted if, if barack obama had looked side-eyed at a u.s olympian it would have been a five-day story trump's out there they're all out there trashing them they, they hate the capitol hill police they hated that uh, insurrection hearing. They, Laura Ingram, uh, just, uh, went after these people by name. And Tucker Carlson goes to Hungary and talks down in the United States to a Fox News audience. So, yeah, I, I, you know, part of it is the fear and the lost of, you know, the fear of lost America. You know, Roger Ailes created Fox News so people would be scared out of their mind every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So you absolutely have to drive that point home. And so if you ask a conservative, they'd say, well, I hate Biden's America, you know, or I hate the socialist America, and or, I hate Obama, I hated Obama's America. I'm, I'm gonna save the real America. Uh, but, but, you know, I wrote a piece, you know, this week at, at, at Press Run, you know, I, I think the Republican party has become the fifth column in this war on COVID. I mean, how else can you describe just the open misinformation, deliberate lies about a vaccine during a time of a public health crisis. I mean, they're attacking America from within. There's no question. They want this pandemic to continue. I don't know if it's because they think it'll hurt Biden. These are people who, you know, the entire Republican Party, we have, uh, you know, members speaking out of, against the vaccine. These people didn't care about vaccine one day in their life before you know, 2021. They didn't use their platforms to warn people against inoculations. This is specifically tied uh, to COVID and, and Biden and partisan warfare. So there's no other country, certainly no other leading country in the world that's trying to recover from a pandemic while facing a deep pocketed political and media movement that is determined to keep the pandemic going. I mean, if we had a rational Republican party, uh, we'd be at 60, 65 percent vaccination rate right now. Uh, we wouldn't have yeah. mask mandates uh, for schools and, and Biden would be riding this success. Um, so, yeah, I think they do hate America. I think they don't want it to succeed. Uh, people around the world just look at this in terms of the COVID response in the last month or two. And 
it, it's it's obviously bewildering. You know, we have states like Arkansas throwing away 100,000 vaccines because nobody will show up for it. People around the world think, continue to think, you know, a part of this country has just completely lost its mind. Uh, and that's accurate. Yeah. Well, it is. And, you know, but that analysis that you just said, it's also not something that you hear about in the mainstream no. press. Uh, no. I mean, and for instance, Janine Pirro, the Fox News host, she literally said on her program, if Biden can't convince a lot of us to get a vaccine, well, that's his fault. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and we uh, see that and I'm real quick. We see that in the mainstream media. We've seen the last week or so uh, Biden has failed. Uh, you know, this lack of vaccination, the Delta, the surge of the Delta variant is a political problem. It's going to wipe away his uh, his uh, legislative agenda. Usually in this report, it's not one single single sentence about how uh, the vaccination hit a brick wall because of a coordinated uh, a crusade by the Republican Party to make sure it hit a brick wall. So to your point, yes, yeah. uh, they, they uh, not only are not accurately reflecting what the conservative movement is doing, they're blaming Biden for it. Yeah, it's it's really awful. Um, and so let's maybe just, and we could probably do this all day and um, <laughs> we and we'll have to do some, uh, do another one later. But um, we have, let me end it with a question from uh, a Twitter uh, viewer named Seattle Susie Q. Uh, and she says, Eric, your reporting is spectacular but I don't see any change in the mainstream media. What can we do? Uh, that's a great question. And it's uh, it's the kind of the big $64,000 question. Um, I will say we do occasionally see improvements and I think it's improvements that come along because folks on the left are, are being increasingly aggressive about this. I talked about, you know, not calling Trump a liar. You know, we did finally see CNN doing that at the end of his um, administration. We did see virtually all mainstream news organizations uh, when Trump tried to steal the election, December, January, uh, talk about the big lie. So, um, you know, I, I think there are small victories um, that, that we can point to because news organizations do come under pressure. Um, I don't, you know, tiny self-serving note. I mean, what we can do is support progressive media that, you know, folks that are trying to do uh, independent journalism, uh, news organizations, websites, magazines, podcasts, all that stuff, uh, and, and show people that it's worth producing original content because there will be supporters there. But I think mainly just continue to be smart news consumers, try to hold the press accountable, um, and, and, you know, easier said than done. And also try to convince the Democratic Party to be smarter about media. Um, you know, just real quick, I mean, there's been an ongoing debate for years. I don't think anyone in the Democratic Party should ever appear on Fox News under any circumstances. I am I know that's a hard line that I have. And other people say, well, you know, we can communicate with their viewers and things like that. I think it, complete, I think it completely legitimizes what they're doing. But I think most Democrats 10 years ago would say, oh, no, well, I mean, what's wrong with Fox News? I'll go on Fox News. I'll have a debate. Everything will be fine. I think a vast majority of Democrats in Congress in, in the Beltway now realize it's a cancer and it's poison and you should stay away. And so, again, I think that's that has been that's become from kind of years of, of discussion and pressure and things like that. So I think people who, who are concerned about the media there are ways to, uh, you know, make our voices heard. Sorry, I muted myself again. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I would add to our, our uh, viewer that, uh, to, to Seattle, Susie Q, that, you know, uh, uh, the one good thing about our current media environment is that most of these media oh. you know an anchors are on twitter and yeah you know and you are on twitter too and so yeah i think that it, pushing back and telling these people what they're doing as they do it so like yeah. when they, if they post a link to their story you know i wrote this story here about how you know whatever you know some whatever nonsense they've done and specifically tell them what they did wrong yeah uh, because if we and if we get enough people doing that they can't avoid your criticism. They may not ever answer your criticism, right? 
but they will have to think about it just because it's there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick point. And that, that's so true. I mean, in the past, how did you get in touch with, you know, a New York Times reporter? Uh, you, I guess you could leave a voicemail, send an email, they'll never read. Uh, you can tweet them, be incredibly, you know, serious and respectful. I don't think name calling works that well. Uh, but you can respond and say, look, this is this is why the story is wrong. And again, it's, it's, it's back to, you know, the, the viewer's question. It's a tiny silver lining. But we have seen several instances where news organizations change headlines. For instance, New York Times have done it. They put up just, you know, a ridiculous, you know, some sort of false equivalency headline or just awful. And they get pummeled uh, on, on Twitter. And within hours, you know, they have a they have a legitimate real headline up. Um, so they they do pay attention, uh, and and that's a way to get into people's ear if you if you want to. Again, I suggest you know uh, do it respectfully and do it seriously and point out real quickly, hey, this X Y Z is wrong, uh, and and use that approach. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, appreciate your time today, Eric. And uh, let me uh, just put on the screen your information here so everybody can have that. Uh, so your your website is pressrun.media. And then you are also on Twitter uh, at Eric Boldert. That's E-R-I-C-B-O-E-H-L-E-R-T. So thanks for being here today, Eric. Oh, my pleasure. All right. Um, so uh, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping. I wanted to say thanks to everybody who joined us for the live show. Um, we're doing these every Thursday at uh, 1030 Pacific, 130 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So uh, let's keep showing up for that. And, and please do tell your, your friends and your family about Theory of Change. That would be awesome. Um, and be sure to leave us reviews on uh, you know, for, uh, maximum star review on whatever podcast platform you're using. We definitely appreciate that. It's very helpful. And I did want to let you also know that Theory of Change is part of the Flux Community Network. And Flux is a new nonprofit website. Um, Eric is actually one of uh, the of our partners on there. But we also try to elevate and, and find people who are interested in, in writing deep stories about media, about politics, about science, and about technology and how they all interrelate. So uh, please do check out the website. And um, you know, if you if you want to write for us, if you've got a podcast, be, you know, reach out. And we've got a contact page right there. And um, so you can and you can find theory of change on there as well. So the website is flux.community. Um, so I will uh, sign off now, but I appreciate everybody joining me today and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the discussion. Thanks.